Well, hello everybody. Glad you could all make it. Uh, my name is Peter, and um, we're here to talk about the Baraboo Pottery. Actually, uh, this is just a subset of a much larger project that we're doing to study. Okay, thank you. Is it on? Yes. Okay. Is that better? Okay. It's it's part of a much larger project to study uh, the potting industry in Wisconsin um, in the 19th century. So, uh, Baraboo pottery actually is probably my favorite of the hundred we've researched. Uh, not only is it a very early pottery, but we went from knowing virtually nothing about this pottery to now knowing probably more than we do about any other pottery in the state. Um, potting was an industry that flourished from the earliest time of settlement up until about the Civil War when it started declining. Uh, of course, it continued on in, in another form, but most of the potters who did stay in business after that uh, went into more commodity products like flower pots, um, tiles, and, and more basic things. Uh, the reason it declined largely was because of competition from other types of products, mainly uh, wood, tin, glass, less expensive, lighter, more durable type products. So the, the, the core products that these early potters made kind of uh, became somewhat obsolete. Uh, Find the page down. So what did these potters make? Basically, they made utilitarian wares, very basic products designed mainly for farmers, also for household use. But uh, these products here are the core bread and butter type products that virtually every potter in the state made in their early years. Uh, a jug, uh, a, a butter churn. The third one is, is what we call a, a crock, but they call butter pots. Uh, a milk pitcher, cream pot, preserve jar, milk pan. A milk pan is what you put under a cow or a goat to collect the milk and bottles. Uh, the top row on this, uh, on this slide are products made of stoneware. Stoneware is uh, fired at a higher temperature. It's more durable, long lasting. Uh, the bottom row is earthenware. Uh, the, the companies that made the stoneware all were located with access to the Great Lakes because they had to import the clay. There are no clays in the state that are suitable for making salt glaze. It's glazed by vaporized salt thrown into a kiln at a very high temperature. Uh, the, and, and there's only, uh, I think, five of those in the state out of 100. So 95 out of 100 made the stuff that's on the bottom row, earthenware, we call it. Lower temperature, uh, it's, it's more porous, so it had to be glazed typically with a lead glaze that made it waterproof. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, most of the earthenware potters did not stamp their wares, so it can be very difficult to identify the maker of any given piece. So we have, out of the 100 potters, or say 95 potters that made earthenware, <clears throat> only about a third of those we can actually say that we have a piece of pottery that we know for sure they made. Most of them we just don't know. And <clears throat> Baraboo, the Baraboo pottery is one of those that did not sign their wares and there, there was not much, uh, many examples available. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the ones that we could not identify, one of the things we're hoping to do is figure out a way to do that. We have, we have hundreds of pieces of unidentified pottery that we're pretty sure were made in Wisconsin, but we don't know by which uh, pottery. So these three guys, we're, we're all retired. We all share a common interest in, in pottery. Henry and I are lifetime collectors uh, of bottles, pottery, and some other things with a strong interest in local history and uh, all Wisconsin-based. Mark Nipping is another guy who shares the same interest. He did his dissertation on Wisconsin pottery, and since that time, throughout his life, 
he's been accumulating information about potteries, I think with the intention of someday publishing a book, but he hadn't done it. So we all got together and said, well, what are we going to do? Let's, uh, we want to publish it, but how do we want to do it? We thought about doing a book, but uh, opted instead to create a website, which we did about a year ago. Uh, we um, decided that a website was better because we could update it dynamically, continuously. It was, <clears throat> uh, we were able to put an unlimited number of photographs on the site. We have hundreds of pictures on there now. Um, we started with just six articles and we sort of publish as we, as we go. As we finish an article on a pottery, we put it up right away. And uh, we found that we could reach a broader audience. We've been up for a year and we've already got seven readers. We were very successful. <laughs> um, so far we have uh, about 50 articles, two of which are on the Baraboo pottery. And um, in this presentation, Henry is going to talk about the history of the pottery and the Poynton family. And, uh, and then I'm going to come back and talk about our excavation there and what we found. So, Henry? Okay. I'm a little uh, orthopedically uh, challenged. I had back surgery back in June, so I'm probably going to sit down for part of this. Um, but, uh, and I'm a little bit intimidated because I know I'm going to make a mistake about the genealogy of the Poynton family, and there's a whole group of them over here. So if, I, if you see a, a wave of people coming up to attack the, the front uh, of the room, you know I made a mistake. So with that... I'm going to talk about the uh, history of the point in pottery from, oh, from 1850 to 57. Uh, that's the uh, period of time that we've been able to trace when the, the pottery was active. They came from Staffordshire, England. And we're going to talk a little bit about what was going on in England at that time and what motivated them to come here in the first place. First of all, how did we find out about the point in pottery? Peter and I have both been collecting for a half a century, and until we were on the uh, decorative arts site, which is uh, operated by the Wisconsin State Historical Society, we didn't even know there was a pottery here. There's a, there was a couple of pieces, actually three or four, that were attributed to Philip Poynton that were on that site. They all resided in the Sauk County Historical Society, we found out. Sure. Thank you. And uh, so we contacted uh, Paul and came up here, I think it was in 2018. And as a result, uh, we got a, a quick mm -hmm. education that there was a, a potter operating here and the museum here actually had two pieces that we could attribute and they were obviously passed down uh, through the Point and family and donated probably around the turn of the last century. When I'm saying turn of the century now, I have to talk about 1900. And the tobacco jar that's got the Rockingham sponge glaze on it, that one actually has uh, writing on the bottom from the Point and family uh, descendants. And that's how we met Paul and uh, that, that really launched our research into high gear. I thought we'd take a time machine and go back to Staffordshire, England yeah. in the 1840s and what was going on at that time. Um, the potteries that were operating at that time, it, it was a really bad place to work. Um, a lot of the post-industrial revolution factories in England were tough places to work and the potteries were probably one of the worst. Um, it was kind of a socialistic operation the pottery owners uh, made the workers live on site in houses that were provided. Um, and they were charged back for the food and uh, other life necessities that they bought from the company stores. So it was kind of a circular thing. They got paid uh, you know, a menial wage, but then they had to give the money basically back to the, to the factories. So there was a lot of unrest because of that. And Several of the bigger factories went defunct back in the 
30s and 1840s, which created a, a labor uh, excess. So it was not a happy time in, at that, in that area. Uh, shown here are some of the what they call bottle kilns that made uh, china and pottery in those days. And um, as I said, the workers were disenchanted, but in many cases they had no, no alternative. A potter's immigration society was formed by some of the potters, sort of a, a union in the 1840s. And the, and the uh, idea was that some uh, dues would be paid on a regular basis and put into a fund and that fund would then uh, have a lottery and over uh, you know, a few years, if you were lucky, you would, your number would come up and they were allowed to come to the US. And that was funded by this, the union dues, the so-called immigration uh, society. And if you'd like to learn more about the Potter's Immigration S Society, there are two great articles in the Wisconsin State Historical Society uh, periodical. One is from, the, I think, 1937, and another one was not that long ago, back in the uh, 2013 or something like that. And it, it, it's a fascinating story, because what they did with this money is here in little Wisconsin, uh, this society bought 50,000 acres along the, uh, uh, the river near, uh, between here and Portage. These workers were then given the opportunity, once they, the, the, the fund paid for their way here, and then they could work off uh, the 20 acres, they could buy, so to speak, uh, 20 acres of land, or at least increments of that. Those that were a little better off, they could you know, maybe get 40 acres. But then they had to, they had to pay that off over time. How many of you knew about the Potter's Immigration Society board before tonight? <laughs> Look at all those hands. <laughs> it was, you get the prize. So now we go um, to America, the new state of Wisconsin. And this site that was chosen, this 50,000 acres, was called the Emancipation Ferry Settlement. And it was near Fort Winnebago, which is now Port Portage and Adams, which is now Baraboo, along the Fox River. Governor Dodge at the time had actually contacted the society to uh, entice people to come here to settle. So now our story of the Pointons begins, because in 1850, uh, they decided to take the trip over here. A little bit of history, Philip Poynton Sr was born in 18, uh, 1808. His father was also involved in some way uh, in the pottery business, but not as a potter, but probably as a merchant uh, in Smithfield, Belfast, Ireland. Um, his son, Philip, um, is recorded in a family Bible along with some of the other uh, parts of the family. And we'll talk about that more later. In 1838, he married um, Ann Joinson, and they had seven children by the time they decided to move, move here. The oldest one was Philip. And so this gets a little confusing. You had the patriarch that we know of, Philip, uh, then the F Philip Sr. That, that came over here, um, and his son, his oldest son was Philip as well. So they came over, um, as I said, in 1850, the, the kids were of various ages. The oldest one was, was Philip uh, Jr., we'll call him Jr., and he was born in 1831. So he probably got some pot potting experience before he came here. I, I don't think there's any doubt. And as I said, the working conditions were terrible. Now, he was better off um, because he was a superintendent of a plant, but still, I'm sure his wages were not, were not great. The whole business of potting uh, through the many years, for some reason, is very low margin or very low profit. Um, they actually um, were looking at a tract of two, two twenty-acre lots when they came over here. So in 1850, they 
uh, boarded the Guy Mannering, which was a, a fairly new uh, sailing ship, and made the, the tr trip across uh, the Atlantic. And then, after landing in New York, um, they made the trek here to Wisconsin. So you can imagine, that was a long trip. And there were some steamships that were much faster by 1850, but they, they chose a sailing ship. Now, where we get this information is there, there was a family Bible, and, and, and the Poynton family here maybe could correct me, but it, it seems to be lost, at least from the source, uh, one relative. I don't know where this Bible is today. Um, but in the Bible, there was an article heralding the 60th wedding anniversary of Mary Ann Poynton, uh, Poynton's marriage to George Gibbons on March 29, 1852. And she was uh, the daughter of Philip. And she tells the story, and she would have been about, I think, 12 at the time. She tells the story of making the, you know, the wagon trip from Milwaukee uh, to Baraboo. And keep in mind, this was, this was the, uh, the frontier. It was, it was still pretty wild and woolly. And th they made the trip to Fort Winnebago. And when they got to Fort Winnebago, uh, Philip Sr. and Philip Jr. decided they were going to go on to, to uh, check out the land and uh, go on to Adams, or what became Baraboo. Now, th this lady, Mary Ann, she begged to go along. And finally, the father said, you, yes, you can, you can go also. So th the three of them made the trek on foot, as I understand it, from Fort Winnebago to Bar Baraboo with the intent to, to look at the land at Emancipation Ferry. Now, the way she tells it in this, in this story, their intent was to make pottery here. Well, that's not exactly what happened. In a few days, the, the mother, Anne, and the other kids uh, came with a wagon uh, to Baraboo, which was a surprise because the, the father and son, they were going to make the trip back to get the rest of the family. Now, she, she jumps ahead in this story and talks about how they were almost immediately engaged into making pottery. And as a little girl, you know, her memory and her involvement would have been uh, a little sketchy, and, and it leads you to believe that they went into the pottery business right away. But that's not, that's not what happened. But she does tell a pretty good story here where when they did get into the pottery business, um, an Indian uh, came to the pottery, and Mr. Poynton offered him a jug. But he said, this jug is for molasses. It's not for rum. It's not for whiskey. But that's a little ahead of the game. Now, what we do know from letters that were sent back to England by the Poyntons, they, they found out very quickly that this was a raw deal. Um, because when they went from Milwaukee to Baraboo, um, they were seeing people coming from the other direction back from Emancipation Ferry that were, they were disenchanted. Um, the land was unsuitable. They, they didn't like the winters. You can imagine the winters here in Wisconsin were worse than they were in England. Um, it's a fascinating story, too, that in England, the, the major landowners kept such tight control over the a access to hunting and fishing that you really couldn't hunt and fish if you were a common uh, person in, in, in England. And here, they could go out and hunt and fish freely. So. A lot of the uh, potters, it, it's uh, clear, didn't do enough farming when they got here. They, had, they would have had to work hard to make that 20 acres or 40 acres or whatever pay, and they ended up getting sidetracked doing the hunting and fishing. And they, and they had been trained as potting people, and they didn't realize farming involved a little more uh, moxie than what they had. So it was a, a bad situation, both from the, some of the potters being ill-prepared as well as some of the land was not as good as what they were promised. There was a lot of marketing going on in England about how great the land was, and not all of it was. 
some of it was rocky, some of it was sandy, it wouldn't produce. So um, we have a, 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 a more detailed article on our website, madefromclay.org, that talks about this. But there, there was a number of letters, as I mentioned, sent back to the Staffordshire um, uh, adv advertiser in Stoke-on-Trent. And one published in June of 1850 of the, uh, what was going on with the, the Pointons here very clearly states that Philip Sr. looked at land, the land that he was allotted um, when he got here. It was 40 acres, but it was like 20 miles from the river and quite a distance from the company store. And it was not, uh, I'm sorry, I have that reversed. The land they had uh, that was allotted to them was really lousy land. And he was smart enough to know they would not make, be able to make a living. So he looked at alternative sites uh, 20 miles away, and his wife, Anne, who was a real pragmatist based on some of the writings, she basically said, uh-uh, we're not, we're not going to do this. We're not going to be 20 miles from the river and way away from the company store. We're going to be out in the boonies, even though the farmland's better. I don't want to be out in the sticks. So that was the end of that. <laughs> so by fate, when they started to uh, settle in in Baraboo, the people were crying for pot pots. They wanted pottery. And when they found out that he was a master potter, they said, we'll help set you up. So a guy by the name of Davis uh, sold them a couple lots of land here in what is now a residential area, as you'll hear about more later. And they put up a house, and Davis also gave them either two or three hundred dollars as seed money to start a factory uh, for potting. But at first, Philip was involved with a guy by the name of Buckley to make bricks. And we don't know how long he was involved in the brick making. There, there's uh, more legendary information than I think you know, solid information that the Noise Mansion was involved with, with point and bricks, uh, the courthouse, et cetera, et cetera. But by late 1851, th there doesn't seem to be any mention of, of uh, the point is being involved with the brick making operation. They may have been involved, but it's not what they were advertising after uh, the first uh, part of 1851. You can see. This is an 1851 ad there showing bricks, bricks. So that's how they got started in any event. And they were getting their clay from a place called Gilson's Slough. And it's hard to see, but uh, this, this corner of the, of the highways uh, can be identified. Whether there's still clay there, I don't know. On the corner of 136 and Cornfield Road. However, by late 1851, the Pointons were running advertisements in the Sauk County Standard for jugs and jars. And Buckley was nowhere uh, to be seen in those ads. Now, in those days, newspapers uh, apparently were very, and we've seen this in other businesses, they would, they would uh, really speak positively of new businesses and beseech their subscribers to frequent these businesses. And this was a case here where a reporter uh, really talks about the great pottery that uh, uh, the Pointons are making and how the prices are very, very cheap. Uh, my personal opinion is that um, I think that a lot of these potters probably could have charged more and, than they did because the alternatives were pottery from the East, which would have had a lot of travel expense put into them and with a lot of breakage and, and that sort of thing. But they wanted to sell a lot and they were advertising 75% below the prices usually charged for such articles. Which means you really had to have low costs to do that. Now the, part of this was probably a family affair as well. Some of the other younger members of the family were probably doing menial tasks as well. The Pointons were producing pottery uh, on West and Second Streets sometime in 1851. Um, and as I said, son Philip Jr. was also 
involved because he was, he was 20 by then. Now, I suspect they had uh, a, a nice nest egg when they came over here. I don't think they were poor like some of the other potters, but that's just a supposition. How did they finance the building of this pottery? Well, first of all, they had some own, their own funds and they probably made some money in the brick making venture. Uh, there was some local investments, maybe even some almost like donations because the, the village wanted the, the, the pottery to, uh, to get started and, and supply them product. Davis did provide a $200, uh, in some cases reported $300 investment. Whether that was just given to them or was a loan, I'm not sure. Uh, they also sold the lots back to Davis and then leased them. So the, and to think about it, that was, they only bought them for $50, so I don't know how much money that was. Um, and then, and this is common in many of these potteries, there was a series of partners, always with the idea that it was a new, a new cash infusion to the business, and you'll hear more about that in a, in a few seconds. Now, the ad at the bottom of this page talks about them erecting a building 125 feet long for molding, drying, and glazing rooms. So there was investment going on. Uh, they expanded rather quickly. Now here are two pieces of, of point and where the, the cream pot on the, um, the right is the one that's in, in the museum here locally. The jug on the left, um, you're gonna see in a few minutes, that came to Peter and I in a collection we bought uh, with the idea that it was whitewater pottery from Whitewater, Wisconsin. But this piece is kind of atypical. The glaze is very shiny, et cetera, et cetera. And it sat in my collection for the last four or five years with the idea it was in whitewater. Well, I've moved it to a different shelf now because we found jugs, shards, or sherds that look just like this. And I'll, we'll show that later. Okay, as the, the business kept scaling up, and sometime in 1855, Thomas Brown joined Point and Senior and Junior. Thomas was a son-in-law. Uh, he had married one of the, the daughters. James Turner, who is listed in a sense as a mason, joined them, possibly as a kiln builder, but he may have also been a potter. And there's something we're gonna show you later that um, with a J on it that may suggest that he actually got involved with potting. In September of 55, a guy by the name of Ezra Card and R.H. Davis became partners in Poynton and Company. So they, they rejoined as partners, probably not as active potters, but to provide money uh, to invest in the business. And all the while, the Poyntons were advertising uh, that their wares were 50 to 75% below what other uh, potter, pottery was uh, costing if it was imported in. But the idea, if you've got that big a, a gap between the competition, you would think they could have raised their prices. That's just, I have a marketing background, so. <laughs> and no, I was not in the ph pharmaceuticals, just so you know. <laughs> now, they were very innovative. Uh, we don't know whether it was Phil, uh, Philip J Sr. or Jr because it's not identified, but one of them filed for a patent for a, a press. And what this press did, and for the time, this is the 1850s, it's unheard of, even in the rest of the country, they came up with a way to press the cylindrical pots that we call crocs, the straight-sided crocs. And uh, this was, you know, this eliminated the need to put a lump of clay on a wheel and spin it around and hand shape it. So this is a big innovation. However, it, it had some other disadvantages. Now you had to put a rim on it as a secondary operation, handles as a secondary operation, and then a bottom. And when Peter and I were digging, we didn't know what we were looking at for quite a while. We finally figured out, uh, that's not a very good picture, we're gonna show you some other samples. Where those pieces were joined, in the firing, it looked like they, they popped off. So that even though they had this really fast, you know, high production, you know, almost uh, automated way to make the cylinder bodies of the crocs, 
the secondary operations didn't, didn't necessarily knit or bond, so it created other problems because we found a lot of crocs that were broken with the idea that different pieces that were added secondarily either popped off in the kiln or in the drying process. The other thing that really surprised us, uh, is when we first saw that tobacco jar or sugar bowl, whatever you want to call it, in, in the uh, museum here, we couldn't believe it because Rockingham Ware, or Bennington, sometimes called Bennington, Ware is really a, an English innovation and there was a couple of companies, Bennington being one of them, um, and then Whitewater did make some. And what I'm talking about Bennington where I'm saying like a cream base glaze with sponged uh, brown over the top. And lo and behold, when we were digging, and Peter's gonna cover this in more detail, they made a lot of bowls. We found a whole pocket of broken bowls. And where did this stuff all go? Um, because we know other, other, other than this Tobacco jar, where did it all go? Well, my guess is that over the years, as the states were dissolved and uh, things broke, of course, and were thrown away, I, I think in, out of the ignorance of not being aware that the Pointons here locally made this stuff, antique dealers have been attributing this to Bennington, you know, Eastern pottery or English, not realizing that this stuff was made here locally. By May of 1856, Davis appears to exit the business. Um, now, by this time, the pottery was a multi-story building. They, they had patterned uh, probably kind of an English factory, if you know anything about uh, post-industrial England. A lot of their factories were vertical. Uh, elevators, stairs, not very efficient, but quite possibly the pottery was multi-story as well. In, in this newspaper article, or one of the newspaper articles, the Pointons reported that they had invested collectively with the different investors $8,000 in the factory. Well, in today's dollars, $8,000 in 1850 is about 300000 So it's no small sum. The decorations on the... Uh, Point and pottery, that at least that we have seen um, in the in the pieces that we found, as well as the one decorated piece that's known, are pretty pretty repetitive, and they have this kind of scroll decoration, and then there are some beautiful flowers, but there's not a lot of variety. But then we may be looking at a very limited sample based on the the pit that we dug. We're not sure, but the decoration with this scroll is almost identical to Mount Morris. New York pottery, and also Whitewater used the same decoration on some of their pieces, and quite honestly, there's a good chance that the potter or the decorator that worked at Whitewater worked here, and we don't know which came first. He may have worked here, or she, but it was probably a he, may have worked here, and then when the factory uh, closed in 1857, went to Whitewater, but we're not sure which. Uh, there is one gentleman, uh, George Mountford, that worked at Mount Morris, that was in Whitewater, heavily involved in Whitewater, but we don't think he, he was here. Now, we're still studying the census records of the potters that are listed in Whitewater, and we may eventually nail it down, but somebody was working both places. Now let's talk a little bit about the glazes and clay. Now, we're kind of nerdy. When I talk about glazes and clay, you're probably eyes may be glazing over, but the, 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 no pun intended. <laughs> but uh, I've been doing enough research, and Peter and I have both been doing enough research that, don't laugh, um, but sometimes I just wonder if dead people aren't speaking to you. I've, I, I had a, an, an experience with a Civil War diary uh, that I won't share with you, but, but it was just a, more than a coincidence. And in this case, um, what I think is so amazing, uh, it hardly can be coincidental, we were, in, in the process of our research, we ran across a, a couple by the name of uh, Jacqueline Baudry and Jean-Pierre Dion 
of Quebec. And they wrote a book, they're ceramicist experts, uh, PhDs, and they wrote a book on Philip Jr. after he left um, Baraboo and went to become a rock star uh, potter in, in Canada. And in our conversations with them, they told us an amazing story. They were at a conference in Washington, D.C. Um, several years back, I think while they were writing the book or after it was completed, I'm not sure which. And in a chance lunch um, uh, break, there was somebody from the Smithsonian Institute archives at the table. And they were making small talk and the, uh, this person asked the votaries, well, what are you doing right now? Well, we're working on a book on Philip Poynton. And the person goes, Poynton, Poynton. You know, I think I ran across some documents from a Poynton. Um, and they found out that when Philip left Canada later in his career, he moved to the Bennett Pottery in Baltimore, Maryland. And in the early 1900s, when that pottery closed, their files were donated to the Smithsonian Institute. Now, the Bennett Pottery, if I, met, I didn't mention, was in Baltimore. And I uh, can't remember exactly which, I guess I contacted the Baltimore Historical Society first, because I wanted copies, because what it turned out these, these documents were, were the recipes for the glazes and the clay that Philip Poynton Jr. used here in Baraboo. So they had been preserved and they were written in his own hand. Just what are the odds? And the, the uh, uh, Dion's basically said, well, uh, you may not be able to get copies. And I think they tried to get them from the, from the uh, Historical Society in Maryland and they were refused. So I'm not, I don't think they ever actually got the copies. Well, I, I contacted the uh, Smithsonian Institute and they said, well, we can make good copies, but it's gonna be, you know, some incredible amount of money, it was $100 or something. And I, I said, well, we're just a poor website, you know, <laughs> nonprofit. And I, I said, besides my partner, Peter is really cheap. And <laughs> so, so eventually we, we got, we, we received for free, pro bono, nice images of the uh, Poynton notes. Now, in our article on the website, there's good copies at the end as an addendum of those documents, but I'll kind of par paraphrase them here. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. Um, the first thing he, he talked about, the, the clays, where the base clays came from. And he said, uh, where made was made, uh, this is verbatim, where made from Gilson slough clay. The best clay is on Windy Bailey's farm. The last clay we used from Gil Gilson slough was out of a piece of land we bought near the bridge. So they actually bought some of the land to get the clay. And then he talks about how the, the pottery was, uh, how it was made how it was glazed, how the decorations were brushed on, a sponge was used. Um, it was, sometimes it was, it was painted on with a brush, sometimes it was, a, it was a sponge, as I said. And then they were, in some cases, they were dipped and drying the uh, pots before they were fired was very critical. If you didn't get all the moisture uh, to, a, to a certain low level, the pots would blow up in the kiln and that's obviously some of what we saw. So in the background, you can see that the exact descriptions that Philip made in this document uh, proved out when we started digging and finding the same types of wear. Numerals at the top showing the gallonage of the piece and the types of flowers. He talks about scroll decorations and flower decorations. And then he actually had the exact recipes for the marking color, in other words, the, the numerals uh, that were put on two parts manganese, one Gilson slough clay. The yellow glaze was a different recipe and notice the prominent ingredient lead. And then sandstone from Maxville the Bluff uh, near the Man Manchester Mile, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, we, even some organics used in some of these clays. So I, maybe you folks uh, recognize this location, but this uh, aerial view is to show where we think the Maxwell's Bluff is. Okay. 
in October of 1856, there was an ad uh, declaring that Philip Sr. had left the business. And it was becoming the business now of Philip Point Jr., Ezra Card, and a guy by the name of, uh, I think it was yeah, Bettel, Don't, uh, T. T. Bettel. So Sr. had left, and he was only 49 or so. Now, a lot of these potters didn't live long lives. They were grinding lead and other things. Unbeknownst to them, they were poisoning themselves. You talk about mad hatters with mercury. Well, potters uh, could meet a similar fate with some of the chemicals they were using and, and lead being one of the, the real killers here. Sometime ever after March of 1857 and the death of Philip, uh, his, the father, Philip Jr. sells his share to Ezra Card and a fellow named Martin. So Bettel is out of the picture, so now it's Card and Martin. Well, in 1857, I don't know how much pottery those two characters uh, made, but the pottery went up in smoke in uh, November of 1857, and it was never rebuilt. They talked about taking the insurance money, uh, which I think was around $2,000, and rebuilding the following spring, but it didn't happen. Now, I, just for sensationalism, I have a photo in here of a a bunch of crocs in a burnt building, but that is actually a local shot from an old photograph in McQuanago where we live. But, um, so it's much later. There obviously would have been no photographs in 1857 out here on the, 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 uh, the tragic fire. The kiln was still standing, according to accounts at the time, which would have been one of the major investments, but they never rebuilt. So, as I said, Philip Jr. left Baraboo shortly after and went to New, New Brunswick, uh, Canada, and ended up being a very highly skilled uh, potter and almost made China-like pottery. And this is a picture of the Poynton's book, which you can buy on, online. The only problem is it's in French. <laughs> so, um, I believe it or not, Peter, I believe the Dion's gave us a an English translation yeah, of, yeah. of just the Baraboo period, but it, it really is a, we found out so much more information on the Baraboo period than they had that, you know, they were quite amazed. Now, another thing about this is Philip Poynton Jr. Uh, died in 1881, purportedly of a malady called biliousness, which is a stomach ailment. Now, whether or not he also um, had a toxic something uh, from, the, from the business, I don't know, but um, he, he was gone by 1881. Spoke almost identical ages as his father. Now the point in name, clearly, still lives in Baraboo. Um, it goes beyond the scope here, but as I understand it, another son, Mayor uh, Poynton, is had an illustrious Civil War career, which is well chronicled, uh, and that goes beyond the scope of this article. Also, I know the uh, point in heating and air conditioning is alive and well, and no, I'm not taking any fees for the adverti free advertising. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn this back over to Peter to talk about uh, the shirt recovery. Well, I mentioned earlier about the fact that many of the earthenware potteries, we don't know what they made exactly. So that's why we go to sites and attempt to recover broken fragments. And uh, it's very common. These potteries broke a lot of pottery. They broke in the kilns. They broke them handling. Some were defective. For whatever reason, they had a lot of scrap. And the scrap usually went into a heap behind the pottery. And eventually, those heaps uh, typically got buried. And so we've, we've tried to pinpoint the exact location of many of the potteries and, and we're successful with some. Some we just don't know where they were, but when we do and it's not under a building or a parking lot, we, we try to visit the site. And we've done this at, at a number of these already uh, with success and probably more without success. But uh, 
Baraboo was, was one of these. We thought we would give a try. This is um, Baraboo from a bird's eye view of 1870, showing the lot. Uh, the, the alley's not shown there, but there was a, an alley. The, um, the, in 1870, there were just a couple buildings even on the site, but by today, uh, there were quite a few um, homes, garages, slabs, and whatnot, so we didn't have a lot of untouched uh, earth to, uh, uh, to be able to search. Paul was able to put us in touch with the owners of the property who are here today, Wendy and David Grant. Want to raise your hands? And they were, they were very gracious. Say Peter, these people had a lot of guts. When we come up, we're dressed like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they basically said, gave us uh, carte blanche. Go ahead and do what you need to do, and, and we did. So the, our, our initial goal was just to find any small fragments, even a one inch piece, a handful of those would have been success to us, but we found way more than that. First thing we did was went to the, um, the open ground, started probing with a steel rod, immediately felt some, some signs that there was debris in there. So we dug some little pothole size, post hole size holes, and Right away, we were finding fragments. So, you know, right out of the gate, within 10 minutes of arriving, we felt we were being successful. Then we, um, then we came on to a spot that was uh, loaded with stuff and uh, started to dig that. Uh, it, as we uh, tore into it, we found that below about a foot and a half, it was solid shards, uh, all waste, discards. And um, it took a lot of time to do this because we're digging with trowels and shovels. And uh, we determined that it was a relatively small area. It turned out to be a pit roughly ooh, um, five foot by eight foot by six feet deep, but it was completely filled. Uh, we said, let's, let's keep everything. So we, we saved every piece that we pulled out of there with hopes that uh, we'd be able to reassemble some of these back into their original form and or repair. Hey, don't, don't laugh, don't laugh, Leslie. <laughs> Should have brought them today. So here we are, a close up view of how they are. These, these things were stacked. Uh, it appears that what happened was this pit was dug some years after the pottery closed for some time after, don't know when. Everything in the pit was from the pottery. There was no modern uh, stuff uh, below about a foot and a half. Uh, and they were just stacked. Uh, over the years, the dirt had filtered in, so it was mixed in with, with dirt, but there was uh, just solid pottery going down. So one, one really helpful thing and interesting thing was that we got to see the range of different colors and glazes that were used because that's so helpful in, in trying to identify intact pieces that are in collections and floating around. Uh, they, they ranged all the way from this upper left to white unglazed flower pot. Uh, the majority of the pieces are probably, you know, the first uh, four or five in the, in the range of buff to um, light browns to slight red. We did find quite a bit of Rockingham. All of the Rockingham that was in, uh, that was glazed was bowls, two different sizes of bowls. Uh, we know they made a lot more because Philip in his handwritten notes said that they made uh, spittoons, which almost certainly would have had a Rockingham glaze. We didn't find any fragments of that. So we kind of, we kind of got the idea that this was not all of the shards from a year or anything like that. This was, there was a large, much, much larger pile and part of it was pushed into this pile. I don't know how, by machine or by wheelbarrow, whatever it is. Um, it, we know that because some of the pieces we found uh, just one piece or just a couple pieces from a, a, a crock or a jug. And the rest of the pieces, had they been thrown in all together or initially right out of the kiln, they would have all been there. And so because of the mixed nature of these, we decided that they were uh, pushed around, and this is just a subset of the total. The rest could be on the site because there are a lot of buildings could be under them, or they could have been taken off site, which is more likely to wear. Who knows? So, 
So we got, a, we got a really nice representation here of stuff we just laid out in the grass as we were digging and ball hosed off and um, it gives a, a good idea what's there. And as Henry said, the decorations, uh, we sort of expected to see, um, as, as Philip described, uh, a capacity over a flower or a fern and a scroll and that seems to be consistent. Most potting companies tended to use their decoration like a logo, so they would use the very same decoration on, across their whole product line so that the consumer could look at it and say, oh, I know who made that. It's sort of a brand. So here's on the right is the cream pot in the, in the uh, Sauk County collection, along with some other decorated pieces, very similar. Mostly capacity, flower, and scroll. One of the really interesting things we found was the, uh, is a piece that was made in the same mold as the tobacco jar in the collection. Mm -hmm. So it had pretty strong provenance, but you're never 100% sure. Well, now we're 100% sure that that is a point and piece because uh, of this fragment. The other thing about the fragment is that it's fired, but it's not glazed. And that tells us uh, for sure that they were using a uh, twice firing method which uh, involved putting a piece into an outer canister firing it they call it bisque firing and then glazing and then firing it again a second time so that's very unusual in Wisconsin we don't know of any other potters potteries that were doing that they were doing it on the East Coast but um, not so much here that was reserved strictly for very special pieces not the run of the mill stuff, like those bowls. Those were single fired. Uh, all of the other pottery they made was single fired. And uh, on the right, those, those fragments are part of the, they call them saggers, but they're little uh, containers without lids that the tobacco jar would have been put into and then fired. And then they were stacked in the kiln up to 10 high. The Baraboo pottery did not mark their wares, but we found a small number of pieces with these mysterious marks that we don't really know exactly what they were for. Uh, some have the letter J or a capacity, a two or a three or a four. Uh, there, there are also some by the red arrow, this little crosshatch mark, which is some sort of a um, possibly a piecework mark. Maybe they were tracking how many pieces they produced or uh, it, it could have been all the pieces for a given pot, a uh, customer, custom order for a customer, uh, unknown. And then that, uh, th those letters, if that's what they are, it looks like a, a poorly formed P or D and an X, uh, but they're all poorly formed. So it's, it's something special. I don't know what it means. Well, the, the J could be James Turner. It could, yeah, it, the it guess be, is that that would be, be the name of the potter, and maybe James Turner, maybe someone else, but whoever it is, um, the purpose of the J being there, it's only on a handful of pieces, so it, it was um, kind of unknown. These are, these are some of the, the funny markings we found on straight-sided uh, uh, butter pots. And when we first started digging, we, as Henry said, we didn't know what this meant, but we eventually figured out that uh, they were making the sides and the bottoms in some kind of a mechanized process, probably using technology they brought over from Staffordshire. I'm guessing they did this there and they brought it to Wisconsin and that's how they justified their 75% discount on, on normal prices. If you look at the rim, uh, you can see it's a different color and it also tended to separate because it didn't adhere perfectly. It's very strange. We checked with other uh, collectors around the U.S. and nobody's ever seen anything, any process like this for making pottery in the 1850s. They actually used two different colors of clay. They had some cream colored clay and they had more red clays and apparently they had both floating around uh, the floor when they were making pottery because uh, a few of the pieces have different colors on the handles and the rims which are separately applied and probably made in a separate process 
and the the bottoms they uh, needed to fortify where the sidewall connected with the with the base, and so they put a uh, a little corner fill caulk like material in there to strengthen it, and this happened to be one that used a different color of clay for that purpose. Beautiful effect and uh, very, very unusual. I'd love to know how they did it. I don't know. This is a, a piece of mixed clay. If you look carefully at the, at the edges of the fragment, the one on the bottom, you can see the, the, the different layers intermixed. Uh, and, and I think this was done intentionally. This is not a mistake. The, the jar on the right is an intact piece from Whitewater. That's not a pointing piece, but it's there to illustrate the, um, the effect. It's just stunning uh, visually. And it may, may indicate that the same guy was at both places. Yeah, quite possibly the same person designed these pieces. This, um, all, of the, all of the pieces were glazed with lead and the way that's done is by hand dipping. You hold the, the piece and you submerge it in a large vat of the, the glaze material. And, and so these fingerprints are probably from one of the pointons uh, or from uh, one of the workers in that factory. Pretty much all of the, the pieces we found had some, uh, you, could, you can always see some fingerprints on the bottom. And when you think about that, as Henry said, you're dipping your bare hands into liquid powdered lead in water and then having lunch. They're throwing these sacks of uh, lead powder around the shop so this dust is everywhere. So it's, uh, it's scary. And of course, uh, Philip Sr. died of unknown causes at a young age and, and you have to suspect lead had some role in that. This, the, uh, the products themselves, the glaze is somewhat stable when you use them um, in, in normal use, but if you put things like tomatoes into a preserve jar, it, uh, that acid will leach some of the lead out and other foods too. So it was probably, you know, the whole uh, earthenware manufacturing in the U.S. was probably one of the, one of the largest lead poisoning events. <laughs> Surpassed, of course, anybody in this room that was alive in, in the 1970s uh, lived through another mass lead poisoning event. And so we, we all have elevated lead levels in our bloodstreams because of that. Unleaded gas, that is. Leaded glass, yeah. These are uh, the rims. The, the lips of jugs, uh, the finishes on those tend to be somewhat characteristic. So you can look at a jug made by one potter and, and sometimes it will help you identify the maker. And in this case, we had some rims that are jug handles that matched a jug that had, Henry had in his collection uh, exactly. And, and it's a little, his, these finishes are a little bit unusual. So that was really helpful. This is what they called stove tubes. So everyone had uh, wood-burning stoves, right? And the, the, uh, the flues got hot, especially where it went past through the, through the roof. So you needed some sort of insulating material. And stove tubes were a very common way to do that. So most potters did make these. We, we probably have enough fragments to reconstruct at least a couple of them. But they're not just tubes. They're, they have a little bit of a a shape to them, uh, probably to help the, um, in, in attaching them where they go through the roof. Everything in the, in the pit was pottery related, so we, um, we found some bones and thought, well, this is odd, why would these food products be in there? But when we cleaned them up and looked at them carefully, we realized that they were heavily worn from being used as a template for turning the pottery. Most of the pottery was, uh, aside from the ones that were, uh, that were machine made, most of them were turned on a wheel, just like every other potter in the state. And they didn't just use their bare hands, sometimes they used 
tools for forming the rims especially. There is a large number of these little clay spacers. So it's just clay that's wadded up and it's put between the pieces to allow the air to circulate uh, in the kiln so that all the surfaces get equal heat. So they apparently used a lot of these. The, um, the thing on the left is a stacking ring. It has some little feet that, were, that are hand formed, finger formed, that um, allow air to circulate in. These, these little feet are on the top and the bottom of this. And there were uh, several of these rings in the pit. There is one piece in the upper right that still has a piece of a, a, a spacer sort of fused onto the rim. If uh, after they dipped the piece, they had to wipe the top and the bottom surface. Otherwise, in the firing, they would fuse together. And in this case, there was a little bit of glaze uh, on the top rim, and so that uh, resulted in the piece being broken. The kiln, uh, this is a kiln brick. So this was um, after the kiln had been taken down, apparently, there was a lot of brick left over, and this one was uh, heavily covered with slag from firing. We found a couple of pits besides the, uh, the pottery pit that had some stuff in it. Most of it was around the turn of the century, but this is one um, unidentified piece that um, we suspect was used in the, the clay mixing equipment. Uh, the Point and Pottery was one of only two in the state to have a cast iron uh, clay mixing device, and the other being in Milwaukee. And it's possible that this was a component of that used to cut through the, um, the clay as it's turned in this machine. Don't know that for sure. It could be a stove part for all we know, but it's very unusual, whatever it is. One little privy that was nearby where we dug, it was roughly turn of the century, um, had some bottles in it, uh, and the space jug, this is a, a Majelica pitcher, broken of course, but kind of interesting. These were, these were privy pits much later than the, the pottery uh, pit. But you notice the similarity between the gentleman in the hole and, you know. <laughs> Good one, Andy. <laughs> I'll tell him you said that. He's bigger than I am. I've been told <laughs> so one of the one of the steps. This is my ping pong table in the basement, and a lot of Rockingham sort of in the process of matching up. Uh, it's you know it's it's a little challenging because. They make puzzles, typically 200, 300 pieces. Well, this puzzle is about 100,000 pieces. It's a little more challenging. But we took just the Rockingham stuff. There was much less of that and see, to see how many intact pieces we could make out of uh, you know, a grouping of, of buckets. There are more Rockingham shards there, so we could probably complete some of these. But we haven't done that yet. <laughs> so the, right. to, we didn't really expect more than a handful, but we ended up with uh, several cubic yards of shards and we went to Menards and bought some buckets and we started putting them in, into buckets uh, uncleaned and we also made a giant heap. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of pottery. We ended up with a hundred and some five gallon buckets. This is the uh, wash and rinse process. Uh, dump a bucket onto a screen and hose it off and clean them up. And it's, it's really fun because things pop out there that are just really interesting to us at least. So then uh, the, uh, the next thing after they're washed is just bagging them up. We sort of pre-sort as best we can and uh, put them in bags. I had uh, a dozen bags or so in the basement lined up against the wall and I was upstairs and suddenly I heard this profanity coming out of the, out of the basement. <laughs> so I ran down there and said, Julie, what's going on? And she goes, oh, 
I just stubbed my toe on your blankety blank shards. <laughs> really bad. And sure enough, it was, it was broken, which meant six weeks in a boot. Oh, no. I said, well, why were you running barefoot in the basement? She goes, well, the phone was ringing. I was trying to get the phone. Well, I said, you know, you really can't blame the shards for that. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I don't blame the shards. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, we've got a lot of bags like this. Now this is the slide you've all been waiting for, I know. This means that we're going to stop talking soon. And also, uh, this is where we, you find out what you can do for us. <laughs> so I know that's the most important thing to all of you. But uh, number one, we have a large number of shards we need to process. and. Number two, we're hoping that somebody, either now or sometime in the future, will come across a piece of pottery that you now can recognize and identify as pointing and rescue from, you know, the permanent loss to the world. Uh, most of the stuff from these potteries didn't travel far. They advertised that they sold in this county and surrounding counties, but typically they, most potteries only went 20 miles, maybe 30 miles from where they were made. So that means any surviving pieces very likely are in this area. And I have no doubt there are quite a few undiscovered still that are there. So one, one thing, if you like puzzles uh, <laughs> and you're willing to donate some time, we thought about having a, a day where we set up a bunch of tables and uh, you know, wash them up and sort them. We've got some really good ways to sort. We can sort by machine made versus turned. We can sort by Rockingham versus not, jug versus crock. We have a whole bunch of ways. And, and there's also some kind of special pieces where we know that this piece would be fantastic if we could find all the pieces. It's probably somewhere in one of those buckets, but we just have to find it. So we go on a search for specific distinctive pieces like that swirled clay piece or some of the decorated pieces. Paul, I think you're gonna uncover this stuff, right? So they can see it. We brought along some examples of, of some of the pottery. And uh, we've got um, some, you know, two thirds complete pieces and I think there's a lot more. Do you start on the edges like you do a regular puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes, you do. Always, the base and the edges, put them, put them aside. Put the yellow ones over here and the brown ones over there. Don't you have the buckets labeled pieces missing? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we did number the buckets as they came out of the hole yeah. with the idea that there is some, you know, stuff articulated right. stuff yeah. at, at certain levels. Now, oddly enough, all the bowls were in an area, it seemed like three cubic feet. So, you know, if it was all just jumbled in, you know, that wouldn't have been the case. So, I, you know, we'll, we'll debate till the cows come home how this hole was filled. Was it filled over time as they had discards or was it a cleanup after the site? We're not sure. But the fact that there are some pieces that were all together in one spot suggests that maybe, and I was talking to Paul yesterday, to make the holes, I'm sorry, to not dig as big a hole if it was a cleanup, the smashed pieces that were, you know, maybe three quarters full, you know, but were discards, were seconds, and they smashed them so they wouldn't take up so much space. We, we're not sure, but they're, you know, as much as we want to laugh, I, you could sort these things by, by color and form, um, and I think we could put some things three quarters together, and that would be a nice display you know, at the Sauk County Historical Society someday. We are open for questions. Yes? Where do you guys live that you would do this at? <laughs> well, <laughs> Henry lives in McQuanago, Wisconsin. I live near Delafield, Wisconsin. So quite a ways from here, but you know, we're researching uh, sites all over the state and um, we'll go where we have to go. We just did one in Twin Grove, which was, which was pretty amazing too. There was a, a large 
field of, of debris and we immediately started finding pottery and immediately figured out that they were making uh, red colored decorated pottery and nobody knew that before. So we've got a lot of examples. All this stuff is on our website, the, all of the photos, all of the history of uh, this and many other potteries.